84 months and younger, or seven years, you can go to your Sunday school class, <laughs> or children's church, children's church. Amen. We'll get this thing right. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 15. And a very well known passage of scripture. I'd like to preach on believing in vain this morning. Believing in vain. First, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this time. Lord, we need you right now a bit more than we need you. At any other time, Lord, you're such a great Savior, the only true Savior that we have, Lord, and our trust is in Thee. 
And I pray, Lord, you minister us to thy word. I pray, Lord, if there be anyone here who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, just religious by choice, Lord, that you would open up their eyes and their heart, and they may realize that they've got to trust you more than they've ever had, Lord, and they'd see their real need. And I pray, Lord, for the saint here, Lord, and minister to him as well and her, and I pray, Lord, you'd honor us with thy presence this morning, Lord, and you just uh, show us things out of thy word so that when we leave here, Lord, we leave uh, here better than when we, we came. And I ask thy blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a very famous and uh, uh, well-known scripture talking about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you notice, the context is he's writing this to a very carnal church. They're boasting of their spiritual gifts, yet at the same time they're messed up in heinous sin. They're overlooking a person's sins. They're taking each other to court over carnal matters. And Paul wrote in, if you'll hold on to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he said this in, verse th in chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? One say I am of Paul, I, one saith I am of Paul, and another I am of Paulus. Are ye not ye carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe? Kind of sound like a present day church. Not this one. I hope not. At least I don't believe so. But the context he's talking to this, he's writing to this church has got a lot of maturity problems, I would say. They're not dealing with sin the way they should, and then they're boasting themselves of spiritual gifts, and he's trying to straighten them out when it comes to tongues. He's saying this in chapter 14. He says right here, verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, and of all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not prevented unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. The context is speaking in tongues. That does, ladies, that does not mean you, can get, you cannot give a word of testimony. That does not mean that you can't, cannot sing a special. But it does have to do when it comes to uh, receiving something from the Lord as far as in a position of teaching and, and preaching. If they will learn anything, and if they will learn anything at uh, at, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What, came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or a spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues, and let all things be done decently in order." And then he goes right on. He says, Moreover, brethren, I write unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which, ye also, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve, and after that he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, and then all of the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also of one born out of due time, for I am the least... The, of the apostles, that I, am, that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But the grace of God, uh, uh, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, 
And his grace, which was bestowed on me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Paul is reminding them of what he preached to them, and, and he says it. He he the, he says this in the gospel. He says, uh, uh, "Which also you are saved." Verse two: Unless you believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received. So what I'm about to tell you, I also received. I had to come the same way you did. He said, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. The gospel that Paul preached, he did not receive it of men. He received it from God himself. In Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, he wrote this, Acts chapter 20. He says right here in Acts chapter 20, uh, he says right here, verse 20, he's talking to the Ephesian elders, and he says, And how I kept back nothing that is profitable unto you, but I have taught, showed you, and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now I behold, I go in the Spirit and am uh, under Jerusalem and not knowing the things that shall befall me save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me but none of these things move me neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God brethren what you have here is by the grace of God and only by the grace of God you didn't learn it and you weren't looking for it when you first got saved. God came looking for you. Always remember that. God came looking for you. It was by his grace that he opened up your eyes. In Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, it says right here, a very well-known passage of scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you say, well, we know all that. We know all that. <clears throat> yeah, but is it? did you believe it in vain? You know, you can... Uh, I know a lot of people that grew up in church. They could quote you scripture. They could... They said, yeah, I did that. Yeah, I believe all that. But their life doesn't show it. They're not in church. They're not doing anything for God. They're not anywhere. And you wonder, did they really believe you know, you can believe in the head or you can believe in the heart. That's a whole big difference. You see, in Ephesians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll come back there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here Paul is, he's going to be getting into the resurrection here. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I also preach. Listen, what you have is, it, is what I received, and that's all you need. By the which you are saved, if you keep in memory, I preached unto you unless you believed in vain. He had his doubts. He had his doubts about the Corinthian church because uh, whether they truly believed it or not. You know, they had a head knowledge. You know, I had a head knowledge when I was saved. Uh, when I when I first when we started going to church when I was in junior high and high school and I got baptized, I got baptized. How many of you in here have been baptized more than once? You know, uh, uh, me, I, I got baptized uh, the first time to please my parents. You know, a lot of kids do that. They want to please mommy and daddy, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's until they get on their own, they realize I got to make this decision for myself. You see, they believed it in the head, but they never believed it in the heart, and that's where the difference is. And people, they they uh, they have a what we call a head profession or a mental assent, and not from the heart. You see, Romans chapter ten, Romans chapter ten, we in another. Uh, none of this is none of this is new. 
Romans chapter 10, but it has to be reiterated. It says right here in Romans chapter 10, the difference is in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It say it didn't believe in your head, you believe it in your heart. You see, because you can change your mind, but it's very hard to change your heart. You know, I remember when my daughters, you know, I don't want to scare somebody, but the parents are the last to know that their daughters are in love with somebody. You think, oh, it's fine, they're just having fellowship, and all of a sudden they get definitely saved. And by that time, you know, especially the father, it's too late. You're not going to take that heart and say, no, you can't marry that guy. Because they've already made up their mind. They've already built their life in their head. And it's sunk down into their heart. And you're the pathetic individual that has to sit there and just say, okay, what do I do? Oh, you pay for everything. <laughs> you know the most pathetic person at a wedding? is the father of the bride. Because nobody cares what he thinks. Nobody needs his advice. He just, his function is to pay for everything and walk her down the aisle. After that, you can go back to your place. You see, that's what a lot of us did with when we were young about salvation. It was in our head. But it wasn't really in our heart. It wasn't until the Lord had to show us that we're the dirty, rotten sinner that needs forgiveness and I'm the one that could do it for you. Right. He had to show us. He says in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, <clears throat> another uh, passage of scripture, Acts chapter 8. It says right here, the Ethiopian eunuch, there the Lord has brought... Uh, uh, Philip down on the, and uh, he has costed this trail uh, this uh, chariot and he says uh, Romans uh, I mean Acts chapter 8 Acts chapter 8 uh, let me see 37 Acts chapter okay wrong page Acts chapter 8 if it looks like I'm nervous I am okay you wouldn't think so. Uh, in verse 35, Then Philip answered his, uh, opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus, talking about the Ethiopian eunuch. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip saith, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You see, that's the way you got. You got to come. It's got to be in your heart. If you believe with all your heart, thou mayest. You believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for you, and that you're willing to trust Him. Have you done that? It's once you make that choice, it's hard to back away from it. It's hard to back away from it. <clears throat> What do I mean? Luke chapter 8. Come to Luke chapter 8. It explains a little bit better. Luke chapter 8. This is a parable of the four different kinds, types of, of ground that the seed fell on. The seed, which is the word of God. In Luke chapter 8, it says right here in verse uh, 4. Luke chapter 8, verse 4. And when much people were gathered together, and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell amongst thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground, sprang up and bare fruit unto a hundredfold, and when he had said these things, he said, He that hath ears, let him uh, to hear, let him hear. And the disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given unto know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might see, and hear they might not understand. You know what God is looking for? 
when you make a choice for him, he looking, he's looking for honesty. He's not looking for a glib. Oh, okay, I, I need to do that. I'm going to check that box off because that I haven't done it yet. So I'll just go, okay, is that what you want? I'll go along my merry way. You know what a lot of people do? They treat Christianity that way. It's got to be deeper than that. And he says right here, uh, <clears throat> now the parable is this, verse 11. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, and they come, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. Those are those that come to church, they just go through the motions and they let the word come in one ear and out the other and they go out and they go just as probably even worse than when they came. And then they are on the rock, they on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. And these have no root which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. These are those that uh, say, oh man, that sounds neat. That sounds neat. Yeah, I believe, I believe, but then as soon as persecution arises, then they count the cost. And they say, it's not worth it. You know, that was just a little bit. Maybe I was just a little bit, uh, you know, emotional at the time. And then, then, and they which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. This one, that they may be saved, but as soon as a plant starts to grow, all the weeds spring up and all the cares of this life, all the cares and the and the pleasures of this light choke any kind of fruit out of their life. They never put on any fruit. They just grow a bunch of leaves. But that on the good ground are they which are in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. You see, in order for you not to have a vain faith, or believing something in vain, you've got to have an honest and good heart. You know, when you came to Christ, it was not, he was looking down upon your heart, and he says, is this guy being real? Is this gal being real? Or are they just using me for a fire escape? I really believe this. Why did you get saved? The motive has got to be there, that Lord, I want forgiveness of my sin. You know why the Lord, and I keep referring to it, because it's the best illustration in the Word of God that I know of what real salvation is. You have the thief on the cross. One minute, they're both railing upon the Lord. And then the next minute, you have one of them come to himself and realize he's in a jam. He's not getting off this cross. He's, he's about a few minutes or an hour away from death. And he reaches out in faith and he realizes that it is his sin that brought him to that place. His sin. Not somebody else's. His sin brought him to that place of capital punishment. And doing what any sinner needs to do is that he couldn't even move his body. I imagine all he could do because he was strapped down to that cross. All he could do was move his head toward the Lord and say, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And what did Jesus Christ say? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Have you done that? When you, when you, when you made your profession, is that what you did? Or you just did it because mommy thought it would be a neat thing to do? Or daddy would be proud of you if you did that? I did that when I was a kid. But I wasn't saved. I didn't want to have anything to do with Christ until he put me in the jam, until he put me where he could talk to me and where I could seek him out. You see, you can believe in your head, but that's not going to do you a bit of good. And that's why so many people, these little kids, 
nothing wrong with child evangelism. I'm all for it. I keep you, the thing is, you keep dealing with your kids, keep dealing with your children, keep dealing with your young people. That, that maybe one day the thing will take. My youngest son, he was baptized, I think, ten times until he finally got the thing right. Not that baptism saved him, but that's how many professions he made. It wasn't until the last time. It only takes when you get really honest with God for once in your life. Quit blaming everybody else for your problems. The reason why your life is messed up is because three people had, had told you what to do. is you, yourself, and, and yourself. Or me, myself, and I. We have nobody else to blame. When you get up to the judgment, if you're lost, you're not going to be looking around. Well, uh, my wife kept me out of church. That's your problem. No, you won't have that. You know what? uh, The next thing is, your religion is vain. Your belief is vain is when you add works to it. You know, there's some people who spend all their life, especially in these uh, in these big religious organizations, they're in danger of. Uh, imagine being in church all your life and not knowing where you're going when you die. You know why? Because you've been trusting in something other than the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Lord were to. I'm going to add, uh, I've done this before. What comes to your mind? If I were to ask you, what are you trusting in for salvation? The very thing that comes to your mind, first of all, if you're trusting in the wrong things, it'll come up. Well, I went to church. No, that's a work. You can't. It says, the Bible says, for by Ephesians chapter 2, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus chapter 3 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy has he saved us by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. You see, you can only get to God one way, and that's through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Why is that? Why did he choose that? 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, if you, these churches, they, some of them, they get into the, and they start adding things, start adding things. Paul wrote to Galatians, uh, to the Galatians, what? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Or are you so made perfect by the flesh? You weren't good enough to get to heaven by your good works, and you're certainly not good enough to keep it by your good works. It's by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 29, uh, well, it says right here, uh, verse 27, But God hath chosen the foolishness, the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and things which are despised have God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You know why you don't want it? First of all, your works are not good enough. We're all got uh, this sickness called sin in our life. We receive from our great, 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 super great granddaddy. And it's what's killing us. And uh, God cannot receive an unclean thing. He is of the too pure of eyes to behold iniquity. Here the Lord Jesus Christ told the Pharisees, he said, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. You put anything beside Jesus Christ in your faith, you're not, you're believing in vain. Your works are not good enough. Your works are as filthy rags and you can't work your way to heaven. God knew it. He knew that uh, the only thing that God would accept is his blood of his son, Jesus Christ. What are you trusting in? You see, there's a, you'd be think, well, well, they know the doctrine and all that. You'd be surprised. There are a lot of people that have been in churches for years, and they're holding on to something that they have done. Oh, well, I've been faithful in church. 
That ain't going to cut it. Oh, I, I, I memorize the Bible. That ain't going to cut it. What is your heart resting on? What is your faith resting on? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ alone? Or is it something else that you're holding on to? Paul said this. He says in First Corinthians, uh, in Galatians, in Galatians chapter one, verse six, he he was he got right to the point with them. He says, "I marvel that you are soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of God, into another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel. But though we are an angel preach." Uh, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And we said there, as we said before, so now I now, now I so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you uh, that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? If I yet please men, I should not be the servant of God. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which is which preached of me is not of man, neither I received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, if you could work your way to heaven, or if you had a little smidgen of part of the salvation, you know what you'd be up there? You'd be strutting your stuff. Rather than giving glory to the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, I'm, I'm so glad I'm here. I'm so glad you made it so simple, Lord. I'm so glad that you died for me. No, you'd be standing around, yeah, I'm glad. Uh, yeah. I have led several people, you know, I, I run the bus route, you know. That's what you'd be doing. You'd be kissing your hand. There ain't nobody going to get any praise up there. It'll be all for him. And if that bores you, there's something wrong with your salary. And even then, even in Bible-believing churches, this happens. And I want you to take this right. I, not, I'm not saying it's happening here, and I don't think it is, but uh, it says right here in Colossians chapter 2, uh, it says in verse 6, As ye have therefore received Jesus, Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. What does that mean? How did you receive Jesus Christ? By grace, through faith, no works involved. Okay? He tells them to continue in that. He says, rooted and built up in him and established in the face as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head uh, of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the bodies of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. You, you see anywhere where you had any part in that? No, he did it all. He did it all. Keep your grubby hands off of it. You're not good enough to make it on your own. The only thing you're left to do is to trust him, only trust him. He said, in you being dead in your sins and circumcision your flesh, hath he quickened together and having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances with against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross and having spoiled principalities and powers. And he made a show of them open. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of holy day or a new moon or a Sabbath days, which is a, sad, a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. You know what people come along? They start adding things to it. They start adding things to it. Well, you need to do this. You need to do that. And they'll mangle scripture and they'll take it out of it. And they'll say, you need to tithe under the Old Testament when there's no such thing as a tithe. I, sorry to, you know, I know it's a sacrilege, but there is no tithe. 
You don't really tithe anything. You know, uh, the, the new mes- the method of a New Testament giving is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. God loveth the cheerful giver. These people that say, well, you got to tithe or you're not right with God. Well, they mangle scripture and they take it out of context. Just talking to the nation of Israel who had to tithe everything they owned. And who'd they give it to? They gave it to the priesthood. They didn't give it to the church. And stuff like that. When you start adding to it, taste not, handle not, taste not, uh, you know, uh, all these things are going to perish with the using. And what have you done? You've complicated and made uh, and, and, and put your own works in there and God is not, not pleased. It doesn't honor God. You know why God? You know why Jesus? You know why Paul was so uh, persecuted because he preached the cross. People were offended at the cross. You know what the cross says? There's nothing good in you. You can't work your way to heaven. And the only thing you can do is repent of your sins and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Apart from that, you cannot earn your salvation. You cannot keep yourself saved. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, you'd be in hell right now, every one of us. If we got what we deserve right now, we would all be in hell. And that's what self-righteous religious people cannot stand. You know why the Catholic Church erected this big facade of religiosity? So they could control you. They could control you. You ever notice, I'm not getting into the politics, you notice that when the government wants, they bring in these new rules and mandates and all that, and they say, well, it's for your good. No, it's so they can control you. We'll get off that. Have you believed in vain? Are you trusting solely in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you even come to him? If you are trusting in anything else, well, I got baptized when I was a little girl. Well, tell me something. Have you tru- Do you have the peace that passes all understanding? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're saved and that if you were to die tonight that you would be with the Lord? Well, I don't know. I don't know if anyone can, can know that for sure. See, they have believed in vain. Don't be caught with that. <clears throat> Thirdly, you believe in vain when there's no fruit. I believe that if you truly get saved, there's going to be some fruit. You can't help it. Because when the Holy Spirit comes to live within you, and that's what happens when you trust Christ your Savior, He starts making changes. You don't have to, you don't have, in fact, you have to, uh, you don't have to, uh, to not somebody externally tell them, well, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do No, the Holy Spirit's already in there and he's saying, look, that's got to go. That cussing's got to go. That dirty habit's got to go. Your friend's got to go. Or they'll get rid of you. The Bible says right here, <clears throat> this is what we got in these last days. Uh, second, second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. Paul writes this to Timothy and he says, This know also, verse 1, that in the last days perilous times shall come, men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers, those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. we got a lot of Christians out there we meet on the street. They say they're Christians. But by their very lives, they belie whether they whether, whether ever they knew Jesus Christ or, or not. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, have come there to First Second uh, Corinthians chapter five. First Second Corinthians chapter five. It says right here, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse uh, fourteen. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, but they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them 
and rose again. Let me ask you a question. After you made your profession of faith, does somebody come up to you and say, now you got to love Jesus Christ? If you, you know, you've got to prove your love. No, I think it was automatic, wasn't it? You may have not gotten everything right, but there was something in there that was not there before. You started thinking, you know, this ain't right. This ain't right. You know, I got, when I first got saved, you know, I was a mess. I got rid of things I didn't need to get rid of. But because I was so convicted that I had them, that maybe I thought, maybe I'm putting more love in this than I am Jesus Christ. Nobody was saying, you need to do that. You need to get rid of that. You need to do, no. Somebody who was in there was telling me, you know, you know, and the Holy Spirit said, you know, son, years later, I thought, Son, you didn't have to do that, but I appreciate your desire. Because you didn't know everything, you didn't have you didn't realize the liberty that you had, but you you I sh it showed your heart that you want to do what's right. Who put that in there? It wasn't self-generated, it was a Holy Spirit saying, you know, if God comes to move into your house, do you think he's going to change things? It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he says, uh, wherefore, verse 16, wherefore, know we him no, uh, no man after the flesh? Yea, though no, we have known Christ after the flesh. Now, henceforth, know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You, come, you profess to be saved. Can you tell me a time in your life when you saw changes in your life? If there's no change, if you're still messed up in the same stuff and you can do it without him, without getting grieved in yourself, then maybe you better check up. Maybe you never really truly trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Bible says in James, is, be ye doers of the word, not just hearers only. You know, we work not because we're not because we're trying to get saved. We work because we're saved. But there is a fruit that comes naturally from being saved. There's a change. There's a change in one's attitude, appetite, and may I say appearance. Appearance. Things have got to change. They should have changed, you know. <clears throat> and he says, uh, Ezekiel, but now we live in this, a lot of people, they go to church. I don't know why they go, because their heart clearly is not in it. The reason I say that is because in Ezekiel chapter 33, Ezekiel had to put up with this. Ezekiel chapter 33, let's turn there. Ezekiel 33, it says, uh, um, verse 30, And also thou, son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses, and speak one to another and every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what the word of that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear the words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto, him as a, unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear the word, hear thy words, but they do them not. I feel a lot of our churches today, we've got people in the congregation that are exactly that same attitude. And you wonder if they were ever really saved or not. Is that you? I hope not. If, you have, if your life hasn't changed and there's no desire for you to do what's right and you get offended at the word, Maybe you better check up. Maybe you never really were saved. I don't want to plant doubt in your life, but if those things are true, what I just said, maybe you need to check up. And when this cometh to pass, and lo, it will come, 
then shall they know that a prophet has been among them. Let's come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. No change. You know you've got a vain religion when there's been no change in your life. There's been no change. No, it was a way for me. I made a profession when I was in high school and there was no change. I was still going after the same things, doing what everybody else did, and it didn't bother me one bit. You know, and finally, if you truly are saved, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says right here in verse 10, <clears throat> but the, by the grace of God, verse 10, I am what I am, and his grace was with was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. You see, your religion, though you may be saved, I'll grant you that, your religion may be vain in that there's no fruit from your profession. No, I, you may have all the outward looks of being a Christian. My question to you today is, are you getting the word of God out? Do people on your job know that you are a Christian? Have you ever witnessed to anyone? Is there a desire in your heart to get the word out? If it's just me, myself, and I, and nobody else, as far as God is concerned, your, your, your testimony is vain. See, God left us here for a reason. It was not just to get saved. It was us to, God has ordained that the foolishness, that the, the preaching of the gospel should be performed by fellow saved sinners. He could have done it by angels, but he chose us. Because you know what he gets? Anyone who gets converted through their, your faithful preaching, first of all, it honors his word. And secondly, those who truly get saved wanted to be saved. You see, because there's nobody in, there's nobody in heaven that's not going to want to be there, that didn't want to be there. And in hell, there's nobody there that didn't want to be there either. You see, what are you doing? Bible says right here in Philippians, Paul felt this. He wrote to one of his favorite churches, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> he wrote this to one of his favorite churches. He wrote this and he said, <clears throat> um, verse 12, wherefore my, wherefore my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But you see, that's a contradiction. You said we can't work. No, he's not saying it. He's saying what is inside of you needs to come out. You say you're a Christian. Let it come out. Let him see Christ in you. And he says right here, uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputing, and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless as sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. You see, how do you grow the church? You don't grow it through gimmicks. You grow it through preaching and teaching the word of God. And Brother Crotts can't do it all. We have to do it. Are you doing it? Are you involved in any of the ministries or you just show up on Sunday every once in a while and you feel that you've done your business, you've done, you've done the Lord's will, that's good, that's good. 
No, church is not a work. Church is for you. What God expects you to do is to be faithful unto Him. What is What good is your faith if it does not influence others to trust Christ? I'm not going to see a show of hands, but since you've been saved, be honest with yourself. How many people have you influenced for the Lord Jesus Christ? Can they come to you knowing they can get an answer from the Lord? Can they, uh, how about the workers that work among you? Do they know you as a Christian? Have you witnessed to them? You see, that's, you want to, you don't want to be accused of just having, when you get up to the judgment seat of Christ, you're not going to have anything to show for. I hope that's not your case. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we cannot take credit for anything we do if thy whole sweet Holy Spirit is not in it. And Lord, we know that the only fruit that can be generated is by thy by thy whole precious Holy Spirit in our lives. I pray, Lord, if there be anyone here who's never truly been saved, but they've just been hanging on to religion or they just believe it in the head, I pray, Lord, you'd convict them of their sins and they realize of what a predicament they're in. And I pray for the Christian, Lord. I pray for the Christian. That, Lord, we be more diligent about getting the word out, be much better witness for you everywhere we go, Lord, so that when we stand before you at the judgment seat of Christ, we will not look back on a life of regret and say, you know, how I have been a fool and wasted my time. And it was all for self. I pray, Lord, that we get out of ourselves and be a shining light to this lost and dying world around us. We ask thy blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Do thank you for coming. We'll be uh, our evening.